This video is sponsored by ShipStation. Grow your business all year long with fast, easy shipping and up to 84% off shipping rates. Use the link in the description to sign up for a free 60-day trial. Hi, my name is James McIntyre. When I was younger, it was discovered that I had a congenital abnormality in my heart valve, which at the time wasn't significant enough to be a problem. But in 2027, at age 36, I was diagnosed with mild to moderate aortic valve disease as a consequence of this abnormality. Around the same time, I was also laid off from my job as a graphic designer. My career, which I dedicated most of my life to, has been largely automated out of existence. I come from a low-income family raised by a single mother. My father died when I was five years old. I have no health insurance or way of affording to pay out of pocket for the surgery I need in order to repair or replace my heart valve. Without treatment, my condition will likely get much worse and could lead to heart failure. Please consider me for The Goliath Show. It could save my life. Thank you. James clicks submit on the website form. Every month, hundreds of thousands of people like James applied to compete in the largest game show in history, The Goliath Show. It was the most significant entertainment phenomenon of the 21st century. An average of 600 million viewers across the world consumed each episode, which were distributed monthly on several major streaming platforms. The show is hosted by the content creator turned business mogul turned producer and TV host, Danny Howard, one of, if not the most famous person in the world. On the show, contestants competed in a variety of simple but absurd large-scale challenges like who can find the needle in the largest haystack ever made? Who can win the most consecutive games of rock, paper, scissors? Who can stand in a giant circle the longest? Who can win the world's largest game of hide and seek? Who can stay the longest in a massive freezer? Stuff like that. On the surface, the Goliath show was fun and games, but for many of its contestants, it was life or death. At the time, around 27% of the nation's population was completely without health insurance. 63% were considered inadequately insured, with coverage that didn't provide affordable access to essential medical treatments. 250 million people total, some of whom desperately needed certain medical care. And the grand prizes of the Goliath Show challenges were fully paid, life-saving medical treatments. Every month, multiple times a month, James went on to the Goliath Show's casting website, filled out the submission form, providing the required personal information, photos, a brief description regarding his current medical situation, and a short video clip. After over a year of trying, James had not heard anything. Participants on the show were selected through strict criteria, primarily based on the viewership demand for particular demographics, the individual's on-camera abilities, and most importantly, their story. The more emotional and higher stakes, the better. The show was not a charity, it was a business. It could afford a certain amount of its costs going toward contestant winnings, but only by ensuring viewership was high. When the contestant stories were more dire and sometimes tragic, they made for greater, more engaging episodes with higher stakes and larger spectacles of emotion and joy, which brought in more viewers and more money. But there were lots of people in dire need of medical treatments, so it was almost impossible to get on the show. As time continued on for James, his condition worsened as the calcium buildup on his aortic valve increased. Without treatment, his valve continued to narrow and restrict blood flow. He actively sought alternative options for treatment like charity care and discounts, but didn't qualify. He began to occasionally experience things like chest pains, dizziness, and fatigue. It was becoming increasingly difficult and serious. Throughout this time, James continued to regularly submit audition applications still with no luck. On each new application, James updated his wording to reflect his increasingly dire situation and improve his chances of being selected. Eventually, after many months of doing this, one day, James received an email from the show's casting department. When he realized he had, his body and hands began to shake as he immediately opened the email on his phone. It read, Dear James McIntyre, thank you for applying to be on The Goliath Show. We have reviewed your submission, and we absolutely love your story. We think you could potentially be a fantastic fit for the show. If you're still interested in ABLE, we invite you to the next step in our screening process, an in-person audition. You might even get a chance to meet Danny. You will find all the scheduling and location details in a subsequent email. We look forward to seeing you. You're one step closer to a Goliath prize. James looked down at his phone, completely overwhelmed with excitement and hope. Amidst the vast, choppy sea of hopelessness in which he had been aimlessly floating, he was now, finally, 
being thrown a life buoy. Several weeks later, James took two different buses to a large convention center where the Goliath shows in-person auditions were being held. When he arrived, he sat waiting in a large open hall for several hours, surrounded by other auditioners. A large portion of them had visibly obvious signs of poor health. Some people had missing limbs. Others appeared blind with someone else there to help them navigate. Others just looked exhausted. Eventually, James' number was called. He got up and was directed to a small, sectioned-off booth. Inside, he sat down across from two female members of the casting department and a camera. Hi, how are we doing? One of the women asked. Good, yeah. How about you guys? James responded. Oh, you know, real busy. These days are always crazy. Yeah, James responded. Yeah, so why don't you tell us a bit about yourself? Sure. Well, my name is James McIntyre. I'm 38 years old. I have severe aortic valve disease. I haven't been able to afford the surgery I need for almost over two years now. I used to work in graphic design, but I was laid off around the same time I was diagnosed. Now I'm working as a grocery clerk, but my condition is getting increasingly bad and it can be pretty hard being on my feet all the time since the condition can make me tired and out of breath sometimes. I don't really have anyone in my life who can help. At this point, I, I don't really have anywhere else I can turn. It's pretty embarrassing to be here, actually. Embarrassing? One of the women interjected. Most people are pretty excited to have a chance to be on the Goliath show. No, I mean, I am excited. It's just, under these circumstances, it's a little weird, I guess. Hmm, okay, the woman said. She looked down and marked an X on James' application on the tablet in front of her. Why do you think we should choose you? The other woman asked. Um, well, because I believe I deserve a shot as much as anyone else. And my mother's also been dealing with some health issues recently. If I don't get treatment, I could... I could, I could die. I don't know who would even take care of my mother if I did. My doctor said I could have as little as a couple years left if I don't figure something out. It's just, it's been really hard. It's... James' eyes began to water and his voice became shaky. He looked down. Sorry. He continued, looking back up. That's okay, the woman said. She deleted the X on her tablet and added a green check mark in a separate box on the form that read strong emotion. Okay, that should be all we need here. If you can just go back out and wait in the waiting area, they'll call you when it's your group's turn for the mock scene. Okay, sure, James said. James got up and returned to the waiting area. He waited for several more hours until eventually he was directed to a separate area where he acted out a test scene in which he participated in a small rock, paper, scissors tournament with the stand-in host and other auditioners. Then he returned home. Several weeks went by. James hadn't heard anything. He reached out several times to the same email address he received the invite from, but didn't receive anything back. Then, as James was about to give up on the whole thing, he received another email from the casting department. It read, Dear James, congratulations. We are thrilled to inform you that you have officially been selected to appear on The Goliath Show. We hope you're as excited as we are. You will be receiving further details in a subsequent email about date, time, and location. Please let us know if you have any questions. Thank you and good luck. James' entire body went numb. He was so exhausted and overwhelmed, he could barely process the information. This was it, possibly his only chance to survive. Alone in his apartment, he began to break down in tears. Two months later, James was flown out to the main studio and headquarters of The Goliath Show. He sat on the plane, looking out the window, imagining his future if he won. In his head, he saw himself in old age with good health. He saw his normal life back and a sense of peace that had now become entirely foreign to him. On the day of the taping, James promptly arrived at the studio at 7.30 a.m. It was a giant warehouse with large, ornate indoor and outdoor sets. He waited in the portion of the warehouse that still looked like a warehouse. Metal framed walls, fluorescent lighting, and cement floors. Other contestants began showing up and waited alongside him. The call time was for 8 a.m., but it wasn't until around 10.30 a.m. that James and the rest of his group were finally directed into one of the sets. The group of 200 people were herded into a section made of giant wooden walls that were brightly painted on one side. On the floor, there were bright lights and vibrantly painted lines and shapes. The group waited there for another 45 minutes or so. James looked around at the people he would presumably be competing against, still not even sure what they would be doing. Then, several contestants gasped. 
James looked in the direction they had turned. It was Danny Howard. The entire group began to applaud, cheer, and shout his name as he walked onto the set. James looked around and joined in on the clapping. Danny gestured at the group to stop the applause, but did so in a way that seemed to almost subversively welcome more of it. As the group finally began to calm down, somewhat awkwardly, Danny said, So are we ready to have a great show? Yes! The crowd yelled. Good, good. That's the kind of energy we're looking for. Just keep that up and this will be a great show. Danny turned around toward the production crew. Are we all set? He asked. Yep, good to go. A voice echoed back. Danny walked over and stood in a spot marked by tape on the ground. Nine camera operators finalized their position. Several crew members made some final adjustments to some of the contestants' positions. A male crew member physically moved James to a spot slightly further in the back. After a moment, someone yelled from behind the cameras. Five, four, three, two... Then, suddenly, Danny began yelling at the cameras. In this challenge, the 200 people behind me will be going head-to-head in a Goliath-sized cup game. Whoever's left at the end and gets all the right cups will receive a life-changing, potentially life-saving grand prize. If you pick the wrong cup, you're out. But there's a catch. Every round, another cup will be added. And these are no ordinary cups. Cut. The same distant voice from before yelled out. Let's get a couple more of those. The intro was so abrupt and loud, it completely startled James. Again, Danny yelled more or less the same thing at the cameras. Then again, and again. The cameras cut, and each contestant was given tablets along with a breakdown of the rules. Then, the cameras cut back on, and the challenge began. Without further ado, bring in the giant cups! Several crew members slid three giant red cups that looked to be at least six feet tall into the center of the set. They were numbered one, two, and three. Danny rolled a giant ping pong ball underneath one of the cups as they lifted it up. The crew members then began to quickly shift the cups around as they ran around each other in alternated cups. James intensely followed the cup with the ball in it. Then, the cup stopped moving. All right, Danny yelled. Select your cup. James selected number two on his tablet. After a brief moment, Danny yelled. Okay, 33% of you selected cup number one. Let's see if it's cup number one. Lift cup number one. Two crew members lifted up cup number one. There was no ball. Red X's appeared on 33% of the contestants' tablets. They were then directed off the set by several crew members. Anyone who picked cup number one is officially out. But don't worry, you won't be going home empty-handed. Everyone will be going home with a Goliath-sized goodie bag filled with Goliath Show merch and other prizes. And for you at home, brand new Goliath Show merch is available at GoliathShow.com. We have some great new drops over there, so check that out. But act fast because they will sell out. All right, so who said cup number three? Danny continued. A small portion of the contestants raised their hand. Danny walked over to one woman whose hand was raised. Do you think it's three? Yeah, I I hope so, she said hesitantly. And what would winning today's grand prize mean for you? Danny said. Well, I have sarcoma, which is soft tissue cancer, and I currently can't afford chemo, so winning today would would guarantee that treatment, she said. Wow, well good luck. I'm rooting for you, Danny said. Cup number three was lifted up. No ball. Cup number two. If you picked cup number two, congratulations, you officially made it past the first round. But remember, it only gets harder from here. Bring in the extra cup, Danny yelled. An extra cup was slid in, and again the ball was rolled under one before the cups were quickly shifted around. For three more rounds, James picked the right cups. Each time was more and more difficult, filled with increasing pressure and disorientation. James had never been more stressed and uncomfortable in his life. With each round, though, more and more people were eliminated. Starting at 200, it was now down to 35 people, including James. On the fifth round, while James was tracking the cups, suddenly, a pair of hands briefly appeared over his eyes. It was a crew member who was laughing. James moved his head away and continued to follow the cup. After the cup stopped, James turned toward the crew member and angrily yelled, Hey, what the hell? Whoa, whoa can't get mad. This is part of the show. We do that to everyone. If you react like that, we can't even use your shot. James looked confused. Okay, my bad. I didn't realize, he said. James looked back down and selected cup number seven on his tablet. After each cup was slowly and dramatically raised, again, he selected right. Another four rounds went by, and James continued to pick correctly. There were now 11 cups and eight people. 
Danny walked over toward James. All the cameras pointed at him. Over here, we still have James left. How are you feeling, James? Danny said. Nervous, but, but good. I'm gonna win, James said. Love the confidence. What would winning today mean for you, James? I mean, it would save my life. One of the camera operators zoomed in tighter on James' face. I have a pretty bad heart condition that's getting really serious. My valve doesn't allow enough blood to get through and a pretty basic surgery would save my life. I need to win. I'm going to win, James concluded. His eyes were glassy, covered in a sheath of tears he was holding back. Wow. Okay, James. Well, good luck. You know I'm rooting for you. Let's move those cups, Danny concluded. The 11 cups were shifted around rapidly by dozens of crew members. With all his energy, all his focus, the most he's ever exhibited in his life, James followed the cup he believed had the ball. Then, the cup stopped. James selected cup number eight on his tablet. The crew members began lifting up the cups. Cup one, nothing. Cup 10, nothing. Cup four, nothing. Cup 11, nothing. Cup eight, James cup, nothing. A red X appeared on James' tablet. He watched in horror and disbelief as the cups continued lifting up until finally, cup number three was revealed to have the ball. Congratulations to our two finalists, Julia and Donald, the only two who picked the right cup. Everyone else has officially been eliminated, Danny said in the same voice tone. Two crew members approached James and directed him off the set and back toward the waiting area. I'm confused, James said in shock, his voice trembling. What, what happens next? He asked. Is that the only group number you were assigned? The crew member responded. I, I think so, James said, confused. Okay, then that's it. The exit is the same way you came in, just down through the middle here and then to the right. Your goodie bag is on the way out too. Your travel arrangements and everything else are all in the initial email that we sent you. Have a good one. The crew member quickly walked away, mumbling something into his earpiece. James slowly walked back down through the warehouse and out the door he came in. Sixteen months later, James was at home cleaning his apartment. After experiencing an extreme case of shortness of breath, he took a break and lay on his couch. He put on the Goliath show. He breathed heavily as Danny Howard's voice echoed through his apartment. He lay back, holding his chest, his face clenched in discomfort. Then, his eyes closed. Thank you for watching. This video was sponsored by ShipStation. The world is constantly moving faster and becoming more automated, and consequently, our expectations have also increased. When it comes to getting things, free and fast shipping has become more and more the norm, but this can make it difficult for smaller e-commerce businesses and personal ventures to keep up. ShipStation is the tool that gives smaller businesses and independent sellers the ability to keep up and keep customers happy. When you use ShipStation, your shipping costs stay low, executing orders is simple and fast, and returns are easy. As someone who sells physical copies of all my books on my own website, PursuitOfWonder.com, I know how much of a challenge and hassle it can be to deal with the whole shipping process. ShipStation, however, has made it simple and efficient, effortlessly integrating basically everywhere you sell online, like Amazon, Etsy, eBay, Shopify, and more. It's incredibly easy to incorporate into any pre-existing process. If you ever have or do order one of my books on PursuitOfWonder.com, your shipment will have been processed through ShipStation. Which by the way, if you enjoyed this video, I think you'll really enjoy my newest book, Millions of Little Threads. From a simple dashboard, you can easily track and manage every order, automate routine shipping tasks, print shipping labels, and compare rates and times to optimize every shipment. ShipStation has been a huge help in making sure the prices and weights on shipments are right, and it automatically updates the pricing when needed. And with up to 84% off USBS and UPS rates, ShipStation always ensures that you're getting great deals. With all the time and money saved, you can focus on other essential parts of your business needed to keep it going and growing all year long. Go to ShipStation.com slash Pursuit and sign up for a free 60-day trial. That's ShipStation.com slash Pursuit. And of course, as always, thank you so much for watching in general, and see you next video.